Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. All righty, folks, it is Monday, June 10, 2019, and I am Grimnir, your host for the Grim Leftovers program right here on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Also on freedomsnetwork.com, realliberty.org, tunein.com, internet radio, oh, and a host of other places where the show goes out to every Monday night evening, I guess. It's not dark out that, by any stretch, uh, but uh, Monday evening here on RLM. Glad to have you here with us this evening. Uh, we got a bunch of good stories lined up for you. Hopefully they'll all be good and uh, maybe enjoyable to you. So uh, anyway, say hi and howdy to all you folks who may be tuned in from those various spots I, I see over there on the Freedoms Network. We got Estrella and a few other folks over there uh, pushing a pencil, uh, maybe behind a woodshed. I, I don't know who's all tuned on on that side. Over here on the other side, on the RLO, realliberty.org, we got Grammy Mary, we got Bob Renner, maybe Cowboy Tech, some other folks over there as well. But right here in the main chat on reallibertymedia.com, where you can come and jump on into the chat, we got a large group of folks, well, uh, Maybe not as large as normal because some of our folks are off doing things. But we got a good group of folks here. We got the Beetle and the Moose Girl, Mr. DC, and Anti and Asmodeus Beth Z. Chelsea, no there. Mr. Free, enslaved. Hey, Free. How the hell you doing? We got Java Doctor and Kate, Mr. Rob Works, Mr. Romes. We got the bots, the famous bots, Vanna White and Weatherdork. Yeah, I didn't mention you, Barman. Sorry. Uh, we got Phantom and Cyborg got Noodle, Dakota and Frumpy, and Gramsy here too. And we got Huh <laughs> and JJ's and Kiss and that crazy smart ass bot. Oh, yeah, uh, Mr. Vin E is out on the river, rolling on a river, going down the one of them rivers out there in Arkansas, taking a little break from the radio for a while. But he'll be back in a couple of weeks, and then he'll be gone again for a while. And uh, I don't know, uh, I, th I think uh, Goober's probably having troubles right now. <laughs> so he's not here with us. And a couple other folks that I could mention, but I'm not going to. Uh, anyway, we got a bunch of stories lined up. Uh, this, this morning, just this morning, I was, I was messaged a story, uh, which is not a new story. So I figured, hey, it's not a new story. I can cover it on The Leftovers, even though I just saw it today. It's a rather humorous story, although it was not intended to be a humorous story by the author. <laughs> it's, it's posted on a website called policeone.com, some kind of cop website. And uh, it, it's uh, from the detective's notebook, Mo Greenberg. Uh, I'll give you the title, then I'll tell you something. <laughs> He writes, what cops need to know about sovereign citizen encounters. The first thing you need to know, Mr. Greenberg, is there's no such thing as a sovereign citizen. It is indeed a huge oxymoron. If you're a citizen, you're not a sovereign. If you're a sovereign, you're not a citizen. Anyway, to go on, <laughs> he says, the threat to officer safety posed by you oxymoronic sovereign citizens is well known, is it? Here's how to be safe and professional during an encounter. This article was originally apparently posted back in 2013 and then was updated again in 2017. Still invalid. Still invalid. Law enforcement officers, aren't they kind to themselves? Instead of just calling themselves swine, they call themselves law enforcement officers. Across the country are experiencing a growing number of contacts, uh, beat-ups, thuggings, uh, with sovereign citizens. 
individuals and groups who possess a strong anti-government ideology. Now, while I possess a strong anti-government ideology, I am anything but a sovereign citizen. <laughs> oh, you can't be something that you're not or something that doesn't exist, something that's not real. Anyway, uh, because the be they believe the government, its representatives, laws, and policies are illegitimate, which they are, sovereign citizens regularly find themselves in conflict with the law, although what they call law is obviously not law. At least 99% of the time, their law is merely code. It's, it's not law, it's legal code written down in a book somewhere, made up by a bunch of morons in some big building, and they write it down and say, well, that's a law. Well, you're mistaken. Uh, anyway, although it's difficult to accurately act, uh, access their numbers, I think he'd been ass assess, but whatever, he says access their numbers, it is safe to say that since the year 2000, their numbers and the violent incidents associated with them have increased. Now, the only reason you may have violent incidents with somebody who is anti-government with whether you want to call them a sovereign citizen or something else, a voluntarist, an anarchist, whatever, uh, just a person, just a person, a regular old person, not the legal definition person, just a person as is the common uh, nomenclature allows for. Um, <laughs> so the only reason you would have, you, you jackboots, would have a violent incident with them is if you started that violent incident. He says, here, I'll provide you with some of, some investigative tips, harassment tips, and suggestions, should you encounter a sovereign citizen. But I'd be remiss if I did not take a moment to emphasize that whether you're dealing with a novice or a hardliner, sovereign citizen the prospect of a violent action and threats to officer safety how about threats from officer jackboot uh should it never be taken for granted number one proceed with caution the threat to officer safety posed by the jackboot uh the the, the wonderful police officer Attacking the sirens, uh, encountering, investigating, uh, interviewing the sovereign citizen. Why don't we just call them sovereigns? How about that? We we'll just call them sovereigns and, and just drop that whole citizen part because, well, that just doesn't fit. So, opposed by sovereigns is well known. One must look no further than the tragic deaths. Not really that tragic of Sergeant Brandon Powderpert and Officer Bill Evans of the West Memphis Police in order to understand the risk of spontaneous violence. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're just breaking out into spontaneous violence. Yeah, just like, a, you know, a spontaneous combustion <laughs> from the self-proclaimed sovereigns. I strongly suggest to any officer, any jackboot, encountering a sovereign to proceed with extreme caution, employing all necessary tactical officer safety precautions. Now, if you're just encountering them, why are you needing tactical anything? You need tactical conversation to talk to somebody? One of the first things to recognize is that a sovereign is likely to be more argumentative with police authorities. That's right, they are. They're going to question your freaking self-proclaimed authority. They may proclaim themselves as sovereigns uh, the right from be the beginning, or they may simply challenge your right to authorita to stop and or detain them. I challenge that very authorita myself. 
And uh, yeah, I'm not one of those people you claim. They may question your authority or where you derive your jurisdiction and inform you that they do not believe in the United States Constitution. And why should they? It's been totally trampled on and torn apart, crapped on, wiped butts with, uh, or, or any other illegitimate government documents from which police powers are derived. Now, I'm fairly familiar with the Constitution, and I've read through it many a times. It's not a very long document, 1,440 words. You could go through there, and I don't see anywhere in there that says police powers are being derived from that document. This guy thinks they are for some reason. I don't know why, but he thinks they are. I, well, actually, I do know why. It's because that's what the way their, their brainwashing has worked. Number two, stay on your game. That's right. It's a big game to them. Sip of water. It says, do not get pulled into a battle of wits because, you know, cops are pretty much witless based upon the sovereign rhetoric. Many of them speak as if they're reading from a script. And you telling me the cops don't? <laughs> Often their mantra is intended to simply throw you off of your game. That's right. Checkmate, you little buttholes. Too often, the pig egos kick in whenever their authority is challenged, and they end up arrogantly contributing to the escalation of an argument rather than guiding it. It's de-escalation. They don't contribute to the escalation of an argument. They begin the escalation and keep on escalating until you are either damaged, caged, kidnapped, or killed. This guy encouraged the rest of his jackboots to be knowledgeable about the Constitution. Well, I can guarantee already from what I've read in this short part, he is not knowledgeable about the Constitution. The laws of your state, which he means the codes, not the laws, of your state and your enforcement options. With sovereigns, he suggests that you try to de-escalate any situation when you have the opportunity, which is don't bother them in the first place. Also, recognize that the sovereign may attempt to videotape your encounter. Well, I'm pretty sure they're not going to videotape it. Videotapes have been kind of out of the mainstream for a long time. They may try to video record it in some manner, but it's not going to be on a tape. Eh, maybe it will. You know, maybe you got somebody old school still using the tape. I can't imagine, though. Um, and what's wrong with that? What is wrong with that if they try to video record your encounter to protect themselves from your violence? He says, number three, remain calm and professional. I, I've, I've met many of these jackboots in my life, and they're almost never either calm or professional. Ever. They come out confrontational from the word go. It says, do not engage in an argument. Explain your purposes or intentions as you would in any other circumstances. They never explain their purpose. They never tell you why they're stopping you. They just come at you and start asking for information, demanding things from you, barking orders at you. These people are scum in my personal humble opinion oh not so humble opinion <laughs> the fact that you are being challenged and why shouldn't you be challenged you're challenging the other guy the one that didn't do anything wrong that you're going after you don't like him because he's not answering your orders as if you have the right to place orders on them this does not change your training or what lawful enforcement actions are available to you. Lawful enforcement action. Oh boy, there's a little wonderful thing there. On YouTube and other internet sites, there are some great examples of jackboots uh, performing their thuggery on sovereigns 
where officers were jackboots, thugs, criminals in costume, remain professional and task-oriented despite being confronted and challenged. You're the ones doing the confronting. Who are you talking about here? He also encourages them to take a moment to watch a brief safety video offered by the West Memphis Police Chief, uh, Chief Bob Pobbert, father of Sergeant Braden Pobbert, regarding the dangers of sovereigns. <laughs> this one really got me here too. Uh, number four, beware of fraudulent documents. Sovereigns can be an investigative challenge. Much of their personal identification information, such as birth certificates. Do you know people carrying birth certificates around? Let, let's, let's, let's stop. Uh, d does anybody here carry around a birth certificate? <laughs> Driver's licenses, which, of course, if you are traveling in a vehicle, you are not a driver a dri unless you're driving commercially which is the only time you're actually a driver, is if you are driving commercially. If you're a person, a normal, everyday human, going from point A to point B in a motorized or other type of vehicle, you are not a driver. Vehicle tags, they think these are all fraudulent documents from sovereigns. When asked to provide a name, that means a government-approved, a government-issued name, they may respond that they don't have a name. That's right. I have no name. My name is nobody. <laughs> they may identify themselves as the representative of their state-approved government-assigned name. If you do receive a name, it may be a sovereign name compounded with L or Bay. I've never heard such a thing. <laughs> El Grimnir? B. Grimnir? No, I don't think so. <laughs> L or B. Well, what is the point of that, anyway? And intended to announce their association with the name provided them, assigned to them, issued to them by a government entity. Be sure to document all known aliases. <laughs> Number five, gather intelligence. Well, that's going to be a little difficult for them to gather intelligence since, you know, if you have an IQ over 80, you're not even allowed to be a cop. They, they, <laughs> that, and that is a fact. The uh, United States Supreme Court has said, no, there's no reason for, uh, for uh, to any police department to hire anybody as a jackboot if they are intelligent. We don't want the jackboots to question the orders they are given. Look it up. I'm not joking with you. Another challenge faced by investigators is the fact that sovereigns, or the sovereign movement, which obviously it's not a movement, as you can tell by the rest of this statement, is not an organized civil or criminal enterprise. So it's not a movement. It's just people being people. If it was a movement, it would probably be probably be organized civil enterprise, probably not a criminal enterprise, is it unless it's a criminal just to be a be who you are. It's a fractured series of loosely affili affiliated individuals who adhere to anti-government ideologies. Well, they're very loosely affiliated. None of them even know each other. How loosely is that? <laughs> oh, the lack, this lack of organization does little to help investigators get a foothold. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What do you, you need to get a foothold against a group that's not even a group of people that are just trying to be people? Well, what is this foothold? What, that, that, that means you need control, and you don't. However, the more we are able to learn about these unique individuals, well, there you go, there you go, unique individuals, that's what they are. That's what I are. <laughs> the better armed, the better armed they will be for future encounters and 
successful prosecutions. There you have it. There's the meat. There's the meat right there. They want to prosecute you because you say you're a person that is not beholden to them and their idiocy. 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 <laughs> Despite the challenges posed by sovereigns, intelligence gathering will be their most valuable investigative tool. Therefore, jackboots should conduct thorough background checks based upon the information he or she is able to gather. Obviously, they will look at the criminal records, but go beyond that. Uh, and cri by criminal records, they mean, have you ever had a speeding ticket? Did, 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 did you ever piss somebody off that reported you for that? Whether you actually did anything to that person or not, which if you did actually commit violence upon another person, then you are a criminal. You have broken law. Not government law, just law. Make sure, make use of every database you can think of, and well, there's so many of those these days, you can't even count them, including social media to learn as much as you can. Consider the areas they frequent. Huh. The vehicles they drive. Because, you know, if you're driving a Ford, you're obviously a criminal. Uh, the people they associate with, their interest, hobbies, family, their parole or probationary status, employment or social service benefit status, prior drug and alcohol abuse, scars, marks, tattoos, and possible weapons in the home. Are you encountering them, there, them in their home? Or are you just trying to figure out what they got in their home as you encounter them upon the, the, the street somewhere? What do any of these things have to do with whatever it is you uh, uh, say you're stopping them for, detaining them for? As much as they proclaim their disdain for the government, <laughs> they, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> they are known to take full advantage of all the government is willing to give them or do to them. You'll see below that as much as they admonish our justice system, they are happy to try to use it against us. And really, why not? Why shouldn't they? They, they hate your system, but they know that system is the only tool that you recognize against them. So in order to shut them up and get them off your back, you have to use their own stupid system against them. It's disgusting. Number six, interview and debrief. Uh, yes, yes, he says here, he doesn't mean interrogate them, but that's exactly what he means. He says, upon arrest. <laughs> Upon arrest, make it a point to talk to these individuals. He doesn't mean interrogate. He means interview and debrief them. Yeah, they're, they're not debriefing you unless they mean they're removing your pants. Uh, attempt to learn as much about them as, as you can. Uh, he says he likes to begin with an information sheet. This is a form that gathers general but pertinent information about those Crazy people that think they're sovereign. Not only in uh, not only name, birth date, address, phone number, and physical description, but also where they work, who they reside with, and their marital stat status. Children, emergency contact information, which you'll probably need because you're going to probably wind up killing them or damaging them ba so badly they can't speak. And who they might stay with in the event of an emergency, because you're going to go after them too. This seems like standard part of the arrestee processing. Uh, uh, such terminology, I, I just, this just disgusts me. But what it actually does is gathering intelligence while establishing a dialogue, fooling them into thinking you're their buddy. That helps them acquire a level of comfort with being questioned. Nothing you say could cause me to acquire a level of comfort with you lying pieces of crap. Proceed by asking curious questions about the sovereign status. 
Your posture should be one of understanding rather than confrontation. It's always a, a status of confrontation. If not, it's, it's a status of lies. Because, well, that's what they do. They are trained to lie. In a non-arrest situation, he advises officers to complete and submit FL report. I don't know what that is. Uh, detailing as much information as possible. Informants, family, friends, or other associates who have relevance with regard to sovereigns. These associations may help you determine locations, hideouts, hideouts, <laughs> vehicles, weapons, caches. Oh, yeah. Sovereigns all got huge weapons caches everywhere. They're just stashed all over the place. These guys are loaded to, loaded for bear. <laughs> and other useful uh, information towards building a case to do nasty things to them. Anyway, I'll, I'll let you read the rest of this if you want, but it's, it's all just such total nonsense. Uh, it goes on to conduct surveillance and search warrants, use tact, patience, and persistence. Above all, stay safe. <laughs> These guys are horrible, horrible. <laughs> Thank you for that, Miss Cirque. I appreciate uh, that article. It is, it is hilariously hilarious that this is the way these morons think. Another sip of water. Uh. <clears throat> okay. This article, uh, I'm not, I was not born a Viking. I have not, I am not of Nordic ancestry. But I have a, a, a personal spiritual connection, I'll sh I shall say, to the Vikings and their culture. After all, my name is Grimnir. <laughs> all right, so here we go from a website called returnofthekings.com. This article posted August 16th, 2017. Swedish Museum accelerates their cultural collapse by turning Viking artifacts into scrap metal. These are, these are valuable, not only from a, 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 new, a, a, a monetary base, but also from a cultural base. Following the revelations of one of its angry archaeologists, it emerges that the curators of the Stockholm Landsmimum, Lands Museum have been ordering the systematic destruction of newly found artifacts from the Iron Age and the Viking period under the guise that it would be too burdensome to process. Coins, arrowheads, ritual amulets, weapons, jewelry, and weights that were kept in the past are now directly dumped into metal recycling bins upon discovery instead of being treasured and displayed. They could sell these things for a lot of money. They, they certainly don't need to just melt these things down. That's crazy. The museum says, following a recent surge in excavations aimed at construction that are occurring all over Sweden, the museum excavators are instructed to recycle unearthed iron elements into scrap metal following the pretext that it would take too much resources to process, identify, and store them. The findings are usually quickly disposed of in order to make way for construction machines and building workers. This sounds highly reminiscent of 9-11 uh, as they took all of the parts of 9-11 and destroyed it before anybody could investigate to see what they had there. This was kept secret until that week's declarations by Johan Ruler, archaeologist at the said museum. He tried to raise the alarm, but only met indifference from liberal Swedish media. According to Ruler, uh, this has been going on since at least 2016, as he recalls. 
the example of an entire human settlement from the Bronze and Iron Age that discreetly got leveled to allow for roadworks for the Sweden E6 motor motorway to progress. We do not know so far if this practice only incriminates this museum or is part of a greater scale. Runer explains that the archaeologists cannot themselves auction the findings to the private sector as it would encourage crooks and robbers to then resell the treasure. Well, if you're auctioning them to people, these are neither crooks nor robbers, and it's their property once they have purchased it at an auction to resell them as they want. The money argument for the National Museum and planted in one of the most prosperous countries on Earth, eh, for now, before the new Swedes do what they do best, does not make sense. There is no shortage of funds in Sweden to host more refugees and pro promote multiculturalism in every media, but the money seems to vanish when it's time to preserve European common heritage. The tragic aspect of this situation is that those construction works that unearth the artifacts destined to be destroyed are probably the new buildings needed to house those that fresh, those freshly arrived migrants that Swedish government is so eager to welcome. Talk about full circle. Uh, treasures thrown away when the answer is the people. Archaeological artifacts made of iron are altered by time and roughened by terrain. No one can really judge their quality and uniqueness until they are being processed and restored. In this particular case, no chance is taken and anything made of metal that is not well conserved is ditched. It was even kept relatively secret until one researcher who could not take it anymore had to tell the world. Why do they not invite other museums around the world to collect and protect the artifacts in their name if money is an issue? I know at least 10 museums around, uh, around me that would stop everything they are doing right now to plan a trip and bring back the artifacts to add them to their collections. Why, why do they not store them in labeled wooden boxes as, as it was done for hundreds of years? If not, let them ask for voluntary work to take care of the findings, or let it be given to the native people that are interested in this culture. Even if used as doorstops or cutlery, they'll take better care of it than the Swedish liberal government. The gods are angry. This news makes my blood boil. Mine too, buddy. I am an enthusiast of the Viking Age, being an eager student of its history, folklore, and traditions, as our readers have noticed in the past. But regardless of my attachment to this particular culture, it is the gross disrespect and complete lack of regard for an entire country's history that makes me furious. And knowing the hardly hidden motives behind it makes it worse. Terminally ill patients suffering from liberal cancer, like Alice Bob Kunke, New, New Swede, Swede, New Swede, and Sweden's Minister of Culture are the ones that now approve those decisions and define what should compose Swedish history. Ah, the new alternative history. And choose what will be Sweden's future. The same people that consider the ideal treatment for returning ISIS fighters to Sweden should be, uh, should show, should be more love and integration. I think that's uh, a little bit of mixed up uh, terminology there. Uh, the leftoid cyborgs, put that in, put that in your pocket. The leftoid cyborgs <laughs> will be quick to declare a few arrowheads and trinkets. So what? The whites did the same yada yada. <laughs> this is where they are dead wrong. If we do not expose them and fight this lunacy, how will it stop? This story is just more proof that the left's effort to shape the future of their ugly world using this technique of scorched earth. It also follows recent claims from leftists and ancient marble statues made thousands of years ago are actually racist and were specifically used to whitewash history. 
Like I, uh, ah, uh. Other examples of where history is targeted include the left using violence and threats in order to get Southern General statues removed from various locations in the U.S. of A. Lately, the BBC used an incompetent feminist professor's views to create an educational cartoon where, among other things, Roman centurions in Britain are black. This is a one episode of a series where some Picts and Normans are, Norman Barons are also black. <laughs> oh, yeah, whatever, man. I, I don't care. I'll let you read the rest of this too, but it, it is, it's, it's, ter it's terrible. It's disgusting. It's, it's, uh, who, uh, who do you think you're messing with here? All right. <laughs> it's taken me a while to get to article number three, but I promised article number three would, would, would be of use of, to somebody here in the chat room that is, has some specific ailments that this may be of benefit to. However, this may be of benefit to everybody here and out there listening, wherever you may be. This is posted on Organic Facts. Dot net. Seven surprising elderberry benefits. The important health benefits of elderberries include their ability to alleviate allergies, boost the immune system, protect against bacteria and infection, lower blood sugar, help with weight loss, and to moderate a digestive process. What are elderberries? Elderberries are the fruit of a flowering plant known as Sambucus, more commonly referred to as elder or elder flower, the full scientific name of the most common variant from which we get the majority of our elderberries is Sambu Sambucus nigra, Niagara, nigra, Sambucus Ni nigra, I think. <laughs> you will primarily find elderberries in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, particularly North, uh, in Europe and North America, although some southern species are also grown in Australia. The berries are black or very dark blue and have sharp sweet flavor that make them highly preferable for desserts, syrups, jams, jelly spreads, and the base for various cocktails and beverages. Many people think that they lend to the scientific name Sambuca, which in fact is not true. Elderberry wine, of the Monty Python kind, is a very popular and can be made very simply in the home. The nutritional value, according to the USDA, if you want to believe them for anything, uh, National Nutrient Database, elderberries are packed with nutrients, including minerals like iron, potassium, phosphorus, and copper, as well as vitamins such as A, B, and C, as well as proteins and dietary fiber, lots of that, and some of the beneficial organic compounds that function as anti-inflammatory and anti antioxidant agents in the body and have a you have one very powerful berry. The health benefits, elderberries have many health benefits. Here are a few. They aid in digestion. Uh, Dr. Paolo Picon and his team of researchers published a report in BMC Complementary and Alternative Medicine that stated that Although most fruits and vegetables can help hit our fiber goals for the day, few fruits can boast more than 40% of our daily requirements for fiber in a single serving. Elderberries are packed with dietary fiber that can help eliminate constipation, reduce excess gas, generally increase the health of your gastrointestinal system. Fiber also helps increase the nutrient uptake efficiency in your gut and you will get more out of your food. They improve your heart health. A study published in the Phytotherapy Research revealed that high fiber levels in elderberries help eliminate excess cholesterol from your system and make room for the HDL, the good cholesterol that your body needs. This can help eliminate the chances of developing arterial sclerosis, sclerosis 
however you say that word, and other cardiovascular issues. Additionally, a diet rich in uh, flavonoids like anathocyanins has been found to reduce the risk of heart disease. The high level of potassium in elderberries also protects the heart by relaxing the tension of blood and vessels in the arteries. As a vasodilator, potassium can significantly reduce the blood pressure and keep your heart healthy. Does the heart, does the intestinal, it also improves your respiratory health. When it comes to clearing up a sore throat, a cough, a cold, bronchitis, or any other issue that affects your respiratory system, elderberry juice might be your best choice. Like many cough syrups, elderberry syrup contains active ingredients, bioflavonoids like uh, and thiocyanine, cyanins, whatever, uh, to be exact, and that can soothe uh, the inflammation and irritation. The syrup also acts as an expectorant to clear out phlegm that can trap foreign agents in your glands. Elderberry juice is recommended for people with asthma. According to a study in the Journal of Internal International Medicinal Research, uh, flu patients who were given a dosage of elderberry syrup recovered three to four days earlier than those who were not given the supplements. Well, assuming they didn't get the vaccine, which would have cost them, caused them that anyway. Also, it boosts your immunity. Elderberry syrup has a certain antibacterial and anti-infectious qualities that is very commonly used to ward off flu. Don't take a flu shot. Eat some freaking elderberries. Uh, during bad seasons where it seems like everyone's catching it. Furthermore, elderberries can protect against uh, the effects of autoimmune disorders, even alleviating cer certain symptoms associated with uh, the pain of AIDS. A 2011 uh, paper published in Romanian Biotechnical Technological Letters cited a study which, uh, in which rats who were given elderberry polyphenols were found to aid immune defenses by raising the number of WBCs. It controls diabetes. You got anybody with diabetes? The active antioxidant ingredient in elderberries works directly on the pancreas to regulate insulin and glucose levels. This either provides stability for people who suffer from diabetes or help non-diabetics to avoid developing the condition in the first place. And this one, most important to you, Mr. Java Doctor, hopefully you're listening, improves bone health. The antioxidant and anti-inflammatory compounds found in elderberries can help alleviate joint pain and soreness from inflammation. The high levels of essential minerals in, uh, help promote bone strength and the development of new bone tissue. Osteoporosis is a condition that millions of people face in the later years of their life, but increasing bone density during your younger years uh, can delay the onset considerably. Uh, bear that in mind. Anyway, skin care. Elderberry uh, makes its way into lots of cosmetic applications, primary, primarily because of the bioflavonoids in it, uh, in the elderberries that can boost your skin health. This antioxidant activity, combined with significant levels of vitamin A, make elderberries for preventing the lessening wrinkles, helping the age spots, and are generally involving the glow and tone of your most visible organ. Need to shed a few pounds? Weight loss. With the high level of dietary fiber combined with the metabolism speeding effects of these solid vitamins and mineral injection, elderberries aid in weight loss. The fiber helps keeping, helps keeping you feel full the low calorie count does not affect your intake, and you get dozens of other health benefits as well. However, we cannot bypass the side effects. The major side effects of elderberries include the following. Since most of the berries of the genus Sambucus are toxic, caution is suggested, and cooking the elderberries before consuming is always a wise choice. The branches, leaves, and twigs of all species contain trace elements of cyanide, which can build up in your body and eventually kill you. So be careful. Considering that few species are edible, don't pick wild elderberries, and it is always wise to find elderberries in a licensed and reputable store. 
Furthermore, being allergic to plants in the honeysuckle family is not uncommon. So be careful about being up to date on your food allergies before adding elderberries to your diet. Finally, they aren't known to act as diuretics for some people. So if you're already struggling with some kidney problems, eh, you, you, may, you probably don't want to do the elderberry either. But uh, the, the, the number of benefits is amazing and it certainly outweighs the, 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 the small amount of side effects uh, that you uh, could get from them. I myself recently purchased from a company that I, I do buy supplements from uh, over there on the Amazon website. Uh, the company is called NutraChamps. And I bought this elderberry stuff. It's maximum strength immune supplies. Uh, immune support is what it's called. Um, and the reason I bought it, and it's pretty much the only reason I ever buy anything from them uh, anymore, is um, every now and then they'll put out a special offer. Well, they say, buy this one bottle, and we'll give you two more bottles of any of our products for free. And they pay the shipping for all that. So, um, and they give you like 20% off of the p price of, of the, of the uh, whatever product it is they, they put on that special. You buy one, you get two free. So you're getting three bottles for the price of one, and you don't pay any shipping. So um, if you're interested, just go on to uh, Amazon, look up NutraChamps Elderberry, and you'll, you'll be able to find the product. I think it's like 11 bucks normally. Um, they got played, paid eight to get three different bottles of stuff. So um, they, they make really good supplements, by the way. Um, so just in general, you know. Oh, and if you're going to do that, go ahead and use the uh, Amazon link on, on, on RLM. <laughs> All right, electric vehicle users. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Electric vehicle users. Yes, indeed. Um, May 13th, 2019. Squeezing green subsidy sharks. States start hitting America's electric drivers with higher fees. Sorry, Don and others that may use those. Of course, at, at this point in time, not at this point in time, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nevada, uh, some other states are not involved. However, California, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, uh, North Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, a, a bunch of other states are involved. So the annual fees are being tacked on to electric and hybrid vehicles, ranging anywhere from 50 to 200 bucks because, you know, they're losing money on you not paying gasoline taxes. <laughs> it says, to date, 24 states have imposed special fees on electric vehicles, according to the National Association of State Legislatures. There you go. That's what you get for trying to be green. You get shafted. The money usually comes in the form of higher registration costs that can range up to 200 bucks a year. More states are poised to follow. So although Texas, uh, not yet there, could soon happen. And you know Texas love its, loves its oil revenue, as does New Mexico. It's a sharp reversal. With the new wave of plug-in cars hitting the market in 2010, the federal government and a clutch of states adopted financial incentives to juice sales, seeing the vehicles as a way to fight something they call global warming. Oh, that hoax stuff. Yeah, I remember. Global warming. Um, <laughs> now, even states with incentives, most notably California, home to roughly half of all the electric cars in the country, are turning to fees as a way to ensure their electric drivers pay their fair share. Oh, they love that term, fair share. To maintain roads and bridges. States typically support the... Uh, the infrastructure through infrastructure through gasoline taxes. Is that how they do it? Ha! Huh. They tell you every other tax in the world is paying for infrastructure. <laughs> they tell you your property tax pays for infrastructure. Oh, boy. <laughs> My feeling is that the people using the system should pay for the system, said Iowa Representative John Forbes, a Democrat who backed recent fee legislation, even though he and his wife drive a Chevrolet Bolt 
or one of about a thousand electric cars in his state. Oh God. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> they're gonna find a way. If there's a way to screw you, they're gonna find it. And not only did they convince you to buy these electric cars by saying how environmental they were and giving you a discount on the price, and they're still going to screw you on them. <laughs> all right, all right. This, another one that uh, I found some personal interest in, happens right here in New Mexico. Kind of, maybe. Could be Colorado. It may be New Mexico. I'm not sure. <laughs> On newsthud.com from uh, May 13th. Treasure Hunter believes he's solved long, long-standing Fens Gold mystery. Now, I've been encouraged by a couple, three, four folks to go out and find Fens Gold for myself. I, I have not done so. I haven't gone and searched for it. But apparently this guy thinks he did. This guy said, well, I think I found Fens Gold. In what could signal the end of a long-standing American mystery, a Tennessee man believes that he knows where one of the nation's most famous treasures is buried. This isn't some lost pirate booty or squirreled-away Confederate gold, however. This treasure is quest in the, the treasure in question is Fens Gold, a cache of gold and cash that was meant to be discovered one day. Somewhere in the Rocky Mountains, there's a bronze chest filled with gold and precious gems. The search for the hidden treasure has become a hobby for some, an obsession for others, and for one recent researcher, or searcher, a fatal pursuit. The man behind the treasure is Forrest Fenn, an 85-year-old millionaire, former Vietnam fighter pilot, self-taught archaeologist, and successful art dealer in Santa Fe. No one knows where that treasure chest is but me, Fenn said. If I die tomorrow, the knowledge of that location goes in the coffin with me. Fenn hid clues as to the whereabouts of his famous treasure in a book that he wrote entitled Thrill of the Chase. A man in Tennessee believes that he's cracked the code. Yes, the Tennessee man believes that he has solved the mystery of the elusive Fen treasure and plans to journey out to the American Southwest soon to see if his suspicions are correct. According to an illuminating local media profile, uh, Chris Dotson has become, became, became interested in the story of the eccentric author, Forrest Fenn, and his alleged hash, cash, hash, his alleged hash, hidden cash of riches uh, about five years ago. This past November, after suffering a heart attack and being stuck at home recovering, he decided to plunge headlong into the hunt and seriously pursue finding the treasure. While Dotson is undoubtedly one of many individuals who think that they are on the right track when it comes to locating the riches, his willingness to go on the record about the status of his hunt is commendable, since many other treasure hunters keep their proverbial cards close to their proverbial vest. To that end, he is understandably willing to, uh, uh, unwillingly to share the precise location where he thinks Fenn hid the treasure, but he did provide insight into the unique process which led him to the belief that he has narrowed down the spot within around a quarter mile. Dotson was also encouraged after he received a rare response from Fenn himself who cautioned the intrepid explorer to wait until summer <laughs> to take the expedition. Now, they don't provide here in this article uh, the uh, his methodology, but there are links to the other articles that include such information. So, uh, more power to you, buddy. I actually do hope you do find Fenn's gold, and uh, that will um, take care of a lot of things right there. <laughs> All right, I don't have too much time left, and I still got three stories. Oh, all right, well, let's just do these real quickly here. <laughs> Bear, and this is from March 13th, uh, 2019, from Reuters Business. 
Uh, Bear says Monsanto likely kept files on influential people across Europe. Huh. A criminal enterprise keeping track of people that may have a say-so. Bear said on Monday it's Monsanto unit, which is being investigated by French prosecutors for compiling files of influential people, such as journalists in France, likely did the same across Europe, suggesting a potentially wider problem. French prosecutors said on Friday they had opened an inquiry uh, after newspaper Le Monde filed a complaint alleging Monsanto, acquired by Bayer for $63 billion last year, had kept a file of 200 names, including journalists and lawmakers, in hopes of influencing positions on pesticides. There is more to this story. Read for yourself. I know you're all shocked and surprised that a company like Monsanto, a.k.a. Bear, would uh, be keeping tabs and trying to influence a certain folk that may have a say in where laws and lawsuits go. <laughs> now, for those of you that uh, may be looking for extra income or income at all, um, I don't see and well then here, but I, I know he's always kind of digging around for a little work. Maybe Goober, I don't know, others out there. Moose Girl, maybe you want to try this. Th this could be good for you too, Moose. Um, Amazon offers employees $10,000 and three months uh, pay to start their own delivery businesses. And you got good sized vehicles, Moose. You could do this. Following news of Amazon's plan to reduce prime shipping down to one day, the company this morning announced an expansion of its delivery service partner program, which now includes a new incentive that encourages existing Amazon employees to start their own package delivery company. Uh, the, pro the program, first announced last year, includes access to Am Amazon's delivery technology, hands-on training, and a suite of other discount discounts for assets and services like vehicle leasing and insurance. Kate, you're interest, interested in this? For employees, it now includes a $10,000 incentive as well. The retailer says it will fund startup costs. Um, may, may, uh, maybe you, Christine. Um, uh, the retailer says it will fund startup costs up to $10,000, as well as the equivalent of three months of former employees last gross salary to give their employees what their ability to get a new business off the ground without worrying about the break in pay. Anyway, there's there's more to the story, but uh, bear in mind, uh, if you are not presently an Amazon delivery driver, um, then you could do that too, because they, they it, it, well, I can't, obviously, because I'm in a remote place and probably, I, I don't know, Christine, you're even more remote than I am. Um, but others of you out there uh, that are not so remote, you may, may want to consider being like an Amazon delivery person. Uh, it's a cool side gig for people. You can make some money. You know, it's better than doing like Uber or something where you got to deal with people uh, in your car. So uh, yeah, th there's that. How is it illegal to keep files on influential people? I don't know how it's, it just seems shady. I, I, I don't know that it's illegal. Uh, it just seems shady. <laughs> and Monsanto and Bear are both known for being shady. And finally, we'll close up with this here. From the climatechangedispatch.com website. Old news to all of us, new news to other folks. How climate alarmists use scientific trickery to push global warming. With the empirical data show so clearly that computer climate models grossly exaggerate the warming effect of carbon dioxide. Dioxide. Uh, how do climate alarmists maintain public alarm? Uh, tricks. Among the more famous was Mike's Nature Trick. University of East Anglia client, client scientist Phil Jones writes that he used Mike's Nature Trick of adding real temps to each series for the last 20 years from 1981 onwards and 
uh, from 1961 for Keith uh, to hide the decline. If you remember the Minnesotans for Global Warming song over there on the YouTube, Hide the Decline, yeah. <laughs> they got sued by Michael Mann over that song. <laughs> Michael Mann has no sense of humor when it comes to his lies. Anyway, the recent hide, a, a decline in recent uh, temperatures would have appeared in the continuation of proxy temps used for earlier part of the graph that displayed a crucial role in convincing the world what a dangerous warming has happened. Even more famous and earlier was Michael Mann's hockey stick graph, the graph that gave the appearance of a stable global temperature for over a millennium, followed by a sudden dramatic warming starting in the late 19th century. The graph appeared, uh, appeared repeatedly in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC's third assessment report 2001, and in media reports published worldwide. But interestingly, never in the later ICC publications. <laughs> because, because climate gate. <laughs> it was all exposed as a lie. Oh, boy. Anyway, <laughs> there's also more to that article, but like I said, it's not a shock or a surprise to any of those here in the chat that are listening uh, to this show. Anyway, thank you all for tuning in. It's, it's been a fun show for me. Hopefully fun for you. I don't know. Hopefully, though. Uh, I'll be back again next Monday, the 17th, uh, with episode 27. This is episode 26, uh, and, and uh, it's the 24th week of the year. Yeah. So another grim leftovers next Monday evening. Uh, tonight, tomorrow, tonight, whatever you want to call it, 2 a.m. Eastern time this morning, Flash Somebody's Program in a Perfect World is moving from 2 p.m. Wait, 1 p.m. Eastern time to 2 a.m. So back it up 11 hours, 2 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, right here on RLM Radio. So if anybody's awake at 2 a.m. Eastern Time and wants to listen to Flash, that's when you'll catch him. If not, I'll be posting the podcast in the morning after I get up. So bear that in mind. Um, Grammy's on Wednesday and Friday at 7 p.m. at her normal time. Flash will be on, I do believe it is normal, daytime show for us, not a nighttime show for him. Uh, yeah, he's over there in Denmark or somewhere in Europe. <laughs> so so he's at a different time. So check him out Friday night. I will be on myself without the Moose Girl. The Moose Girl's going to the Blue Ox Festival there in Eau Claire. So it'll be Balls to the Wall show program Friday night. Vinny is off for a couple of weeks. He won't be on Friday. Uh, check the schedule over there on RLM for the rest of the shows. Thank y'all very much. Love ya. Peace.